Welcome, everybody. Um, so my name is Katie Nelson, and my wife and I are the caretakers here uh, up at the Moon Randolph Homestead. And uh, this is a historic site. It's owned by the city of Missoula. And as you might imagine, the Moon and Randolph families lived on the site to, one after another for about 130 years. And these families planted this orchard behind us. Uh, they built the barn and a lot of the left a lot of the artifacts and buildings that are visible on the site today. Of course, history did not begin 130 years ago. And for more than 14,000 years, this place has been home to the Salish and Calispe people. Uh, there are Salish and Calispe stories dating back to the last ice age in this area. And uh, the Salish, there was a trail that came up the road that you guys drove to get here. Uh, it went over the North Hills into the Rattlesnake Valley, out to Potomac to, uh, um, and beyond to uh, uh, bison hunting grounds out on the plains. Um, there was a common Salish camp down by where the uh, interstate intersects the um, uh, dirt road here. And that's where the Salish would camp to uh, dig and harvest and tend um, bitterroot up on the North Hills. So um, this is a place that is just deep in history. Uh, and we are so more than happy to share it uh, with the public. Uh, you're welcome to come up here. We, we have, we're open on Saturdays, May through October. Uh, we have a kids camp um, and we're just have been so uh, grateful to have been a part of open air. Um, this is having artists in residence is something that we talked about as an organization for many, many years. And it was just something that we didn't have the capacity to do on our own. And, uh, and so this graces, I, I was just counting our seventh artist. Um, and so we're so happy to have Grace and uh, we're gonna let her talk, but um, first I'm gonna invite Kelly up here to introduce her. So thank you all. Hi, thank you, Katie and oh, is this on? welcome everybody. Um, Grace Brogan is an interdisciplinary artist currently focusing her work on broom making and the intersection of traditional craft and contemporary design. Her practice cultivates connections between people, humans, and beyond human world. Grace explores the life of raw materials and the processes that bring those items to a state of service in our current culture with eyes open to the social, economic, and environmental impacts of the journey. She studied art as an undergraduate before embarking on an over a decade of study with craftspeople in ceramics, wood, textiles, including broom makers in 2009 and 2018. During that time, she also worked closely with farmers and other rural entrepreneurs to encourage the growth of values-based economies and completed an interdisciplinary MS in environmental studies, attempting pulling all these threads together in 2012. Because a broom is a ubiquitous functional object, people have a sense of familiarity and sometimes dismissiveness toward it. But a broom is an object open to material and design interpretation while still remaining identifiable as a broom. In broom making, the agricultural skills of growing broom corn can be married with the arts of weaving, natural dyeing, woodworking, and ceramics. Grace aims to explore history, culture, function, beauty, and connection through broom making. So everybody welcome Grace. <laughs> Thank you, Stoney and Katie and Kelly and everyone who is here today. Hear a little bit about brooms. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, checking in with and attending the presentations of a number of the other residents. Um, and it's been so lovely to hear about their practices and their backgrounds and what brought them to uh, the current research and exploration that they're doing. So I will give a little bit of that background. Um, hopefully that's interesting to you. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit of some more recent explorations. Um, and then we can get up and move around in this beautiful space. Um, that Katie told us a little bit more about. Um, 
I've been doing my practice in a canvas tent that's uh, in a little hollow over here. That's quite sweet. Um, and I welcome us all to head over that way um, after a little bit of um, chatting over here, if you'd like to. Uh, and then we'll check out the gardens here as well, uh, because they have actually been uh, growing some broom corn, some of the core material to broom making uh, with me, for me, um, for the last few years. And, and we can see what that looks like. Um, and we will, uh, we'll try to do questions before we leave this space, but then um, feel free to ask any questions along the way. Can you hear me okay? Is this still working? Great. I like this juxtaposition of a microphone and a giant monitor in the trees. Um, okay. I can move forward now so I can see the screen because I'm just looking over here now. So um, a few common threads for me um, are material sourcing in, in my practice, um, uh, an appreciation and interest in the process of making itself, um, and uh, a curiosity about how that piece uh, changes a space for someone, uh, how they interact with that space, um, what it means uh, in their daily life, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and we'll kind of dig into each of those a little bit more as we go. Um, so a little bit in my background, uh, Kelly did a great job uh, introducing me and covered a lot of that. Um, so I, I might just kind of delve a little bit more into um, the, the fact that although I, I had uh, an undergraduate degree in art that was more focused on um, you know, drawing and painting and printmaking uh, with an introduction to sculpture and ceramics, um, I found myself um, kind of exploring some more traditional uh, crafts uh, after that in, in a, an exploration of um, a few concepts that I picked up in college um, and then uh, in my professional career um, that I was using to, to support myself uh, before or until art can do that for all of us, um, where I was working uh, with farmers and rural entrepreneurs um, and where that handcraft uh, and that connection with place and using resources sustainably um, continued to come up. Um, so, one of those pieces that I might mention um, from that background is um, while studying more traditional studio art, um, I was steeped in a culture at the undergraduate school I attended uh, where uh, pottery and ceramics um, came through an apprenticeship model um, and the materials used at that specific studio um, were a, they found a, a clay source in that county that they were hoping would last at least 300 years. Um, and they also made their glazes um, with wood ash and other plant materials. Um, so kind of combining that with what I had, had learned in other studio spaces really drove uh, in me an interest in material sourcing and what other art forms or crafts, um, can we follow back um, to their resource extraction, extraction phase um, and really play a part in as responsibly as possible? Um, I think it was in Kate's presentation, uh, one of the other residents, um, where she spoke about geological time. Um, and I really appreciate that concept. Um, and that's one of the things that led me towards uh, brooms, of all things, in my art practice uh, and exploration of uh, sculpture. Uh, and I, I already kind of touched on this, but um, some of the, the professional experiences I've had over the last 10 or 15 years have informed why I have uh, come to settle on brooms, at least right now, as a method of exploration 
because of the ways I've been able to interact with environments and communities through um, educating youth uh, about nature and working with uh, farmers and ranchers uh, and how they're supporting their families and their environments uh, by being stewards uh, of the land and how we can apply some of those concepts, not only to the art we make, but to the materials, the items we surround ourselves with in our homes. Um, so over that period of time, uh, from college until now, really, um, while I've been practicing art and uh, working in this career I've, I've mentioned a little bit about, I've also had the opportunity to learn from a lot of fantastic craftspeople in a number of fields um, in a variety of forms. Um, I had an internship, uh, apprenticeship at North House Folk School, um, in northern Minnesota that introduced me to a real broad base of crafts, traditional crafts. Um, they do everything from boat building to timber framing to um, sewing and weaving and broom making. So it was in 2000, early 2009 that I made my first broom. Um, and over that period of time, um, I've also been able to access um, some pretty fantastic uh, experiences learning from ceramicists. The Clayster of Missoula is a great resource here in Missoula. Um, a number of other residencies and workshops and um, methods of learning from craftspeople in short spurts, whether it's a weekend or in you know two, three week intensives um, have allowed me to pick up those skills. Um, I would say it's it's just bits and pieces and I'm still learning how to put them together and um, use them successfully. I, I would call myself more of a, a Jane of all trades and a master of none than um, than anything in particular. Uh, but I really thrive in, in connecting uh, all of these disparate threads. Um, that if there's one consistent thing you might be hearing, it's kind of drawing on a lot of different experiences um, to, to pull things together in a way that um, feels true to me uh, in my art practice. Um, I've had a lot of folks just kind of perplexed, especially if there aren't visuals around, like, why brooms? What about brooms? It, it almost seems as random as, a, you know, like a light bulb or a trash can or, you know, these things that are just around our homes that we don't always think very much about. Um, and I, I like to um, think that we do have this appreciation for um, fine vases and um, beautiful tables. Um, and I, I love that a broom is kind of unexpected, but can also um, raise that everyday use to a, a point of kind of turning the mundane into a, a ritual or an appreciation for the history of people and skills and materials um, that, that brought that thing you hold in your hand or that is hanging on the wall between use um, to you. That, uh, can kind of spark that um, side of our brain that doesn't always get sparked. Um, yeah. Um, and I, I, another thread I, I thought I could pull on really quickly um, that has come up in a couple of other presentations um, is this interest in material sourcing and considering um, where we get the things around us from and how they come to us. In some ways, it's um, a point of, of privilege if we can do that. Um, and in other ways, something like a broom and, and a lot of these other basic materials around us, um, folks around the world um, and throughout history have found ways to sweep um, and using what they have around them, what is resilient and bends and comes back to form and you can lash to some sort of stick um, is something they can use to sweep. Um, and finding that um, combination of agency and connection and joy and hope in a time of disconnection and uh, concern for the environment and um, a lot of uh, damaging large systems that we're a part of um, that we don't really always have the power to to change in really uh, big ways. Um, 
finding those small moments of connection and joy and um, agency is something that I feel like this small thing like a broom um, can help just, again, kind of bring that spark back up for us. Um, I feel like I, I touched on a lot of these things. There's a picture here. I don't know if you can see it. You're welcome we, to flip through these later um, of broom corn. Uh, but I also have this vase over here with some broom corn in it as well. Um, and at least in the United States for the last 150 or so years um, until the early 19, mid 1900s, broom corn was the material of choice for broom making. Um, and this is an example of some broom corn that I grew and Caroline here at the homestead, a, a combination of some of those. Um, and that's what it looks like. It's a uh, sorghum. Um, and it's, so it's not actually corn, it's a cousin of corn. Uh, but this particular variety is bred for really long bristles. Um, and then you remove the seeds and we'll look at some examples of what these brooms look like. But again, this is just what um, a, a current varietal in this particular country uses for this purpose. Uh, but that agricultural practice is um, something that interests me uh, because it's a, a way to kind of keep that um, access to that material alive and connect with some fantastic farmers like Caroline um, and a number of other folks in Western Montana who have been testing some uh, broom corn varieties with me over the last few years. Um, I, I would say, uh, looking forward, looking present and looking forward, I um, do have this uh, interest and this passion for connecting people with functional art and craft, uh, but I also like to push those boundaries as well. Um, so there's just a few examples up here of um, brooms looking less and less like brooms, um, but still drawing on some of those patterns, those um, materials, um, and how we can interact with them in space in a different way. Um, and a number of these examples are up uh, at, in an installation at Western Cider through the end of August, if um, this piques your interest in seeing what more and different broom and broom adjacent sculptures might look like. Uh, and now we can talk a little bit more about the place based work I've been doing here at the homestead um, throughout July. Um, I love the idea that um, there's this juxtaposition between. Uh, things that disintegrate and um, disappear and things that stick around. And you can see right around us here even, there are examples of that, how this, there are some metal materials um, and iron work that are uh, showing their age, uh, showing their weathering, but kind of being grown around with these trees. Um, and I wanted to kind of play on that juxtaposition of um, the what folks were, throwing away. Um, Katie was telling me that there were a couple of dump spots here where people would just kind of get rid of materials um, earlier on in the homestead's life. Um, and playing on that juxtaposition of uh, things being tossed out and things being salvaged and things that stick around and things that disintegrate. Um, I've used some of those pieces. Some things we can tell what they are, some things we don't know. Um, and and made brooms and broom-like things out of them. Um, there's one example hanging from a tree right here, uh, and there's a couple more examples in the tent we can go see. Um, but all of this exploration of material and time and um, how these uh, pieces will look into the future, that iron or metal parts will continue to last, whereas Although the broom corn is very resilient and will last a very long time, will eventually disintegrate. Um, and, and all of these kind of pieces uh, swirling around um, at the homestead was just a really fun way to, to interact with this um, form of art. Um, and I'm excited to see more of those with you. Um, so I think we'll uh, see if there are any immediate questions and then we can start moving our bodies um, that's enough of me talking at you. 
Um, after any immediate questions, there's a, a path I can lead us down this way where I've been working in this canvas tent. I can show you a little bit about the process of program making and some of the, the items I've been working on. And then um, after that, we'll head over to this garden and look at some broom corn that Caroline is currently growing. Uh, and and you can continue to ask questions as we go from there. Um, and there continue to be refreshments. If you need those, um, explore the space. There's amazing uh, animals, goats, chickens, pigs. Um, feel free to stretch your body. Uh, and I guess I could do any immediate questions right now if you have any. Several. So let me start with some mundane. How long does it take you? To, well, I don't know. There's never a start to an art. But let's take an individual broom. Let's take this broom over here. So, do you, in your in your process of creating it, does it evolve as you create it, or do you start out with a conceptual notion of the broom that you're intending to evolve? That's a good question. Um, so the question was, do I start out with a vision uh, for the broom, uh, or does it kind of evolve as through the process um, and kind of what what that process looks like as far as time as well? Um, it's probably a, a combination of both of those things because so much of it relies on the forms I'm working with, and because I'm working 99% uh, of the time with natural materials, which is my preference. Um, I, I have to be flexible. And so sometimes I do have a vision for what I'm aiming towards, but I'm always um, navigating around new little uh, twists and turns as needed. As far as the time it takes, uh, this broom is a fun example of what I would ideally be working with most of the time, but also how it's more time intensive because this broom is, other than the cordage uh, and one nail that was where I originally attach uh, the cordage inside the broom to the uh, broomstick, um, this is all homestead material. This is homestead wood from plum trees that Katie just pruned a few weeks ago. And this is broom corn that Caroline grew last season. Um, given all of that, uh, it's a good example that you have to find the wood and uh, cut it down and trim off the twigs and um, and then prepare the end for attachment. Uh, and the same thing can be said for all the things you would do uh, with the broom corn, which includes removing seeds, some of which I left on here because they're so beautiful. Um, and they uh, I will continue to, to take them off, but I love seeing them here. Um, so it, it, it comes in pieces and in different chunks of time. So it's kind of hard to say exactly how long it takes. Um, then there's uh, the weaving process and then the sewing process where we sew it down to take this flat form that a lot of us are familiar with, at least in this style. Um, that said, when I am making brooms in a more production style, um, I'm not uh, always using this this homegrown broom corn because that's something we're still working on. So there's one broom corn supplier left in the United States, despite the fact that it was a like top 10 crop um, in the 1800s. Uh, and a, a lot of that is being grown in northern Mexico now. Um, but it is a United States-based company. Um, so uh, that's where a lot of my sourcing is. Um, and so some of that time intensity is, is brought out by being able to use that supplier that the majority of any broom makers you will find around the United States currently are, are getting their broom corn from. Does that answer your question that's in some ways? Answer. Okay. So let me ask one uh, that's a, um, a flip on it. You started your talk. You talked about your own personal growth from the uh, notion that you wanted to be a broom maker to becoming a broom maker and hoping to be have that be your art and your supportive art in your world. How's that going? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I feel like it's... Um, further down the path than I've been before, which is really exciting. Do um, galleries carry your brooms or do you have a, excuse me for interrupting, no, but that's re related to that, do galleries carry, how, what happens to your brooms? What happens to them? Um, <laughs> that's a fantastic question and it's something um, 
that is evolving in ways that I'm excited about. Um, there's, I, I love that it, um, I'm, so I'm selling them at uh, craft fairs and um, hoping to get into more and more galleries and kind of everything in between. So I love the fact that it is in, you know, potentially your aunt or your uncle or your cousin's kitchen being used every day. Um, but it, there's also a few brooms in the permanent collection at Aeromont uh, School of Art and Craft as well. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, an installation at Western Cider right now, um, seeing them up on the wall really makes me excited to find other galleries that are um, supportive of, of looking at them in this way and exploring them in this way too. So um, I am finding a number of ways to have them connect with people, um, both in that direct uh, into people's homes uh, and through um, education and, and continuing to, to reach out and um, share about this to explore what it could also look like in, in galleries too, and, and kind of those spaces in between. So, um, I take direct commissions when time allows. Um, I do a, occasional craft fairs and then, um, galleries would be something I'd love to expand further than the, the few that, um, they are currently in right now. Um, so that, yeah, that's a good question. That's a wonderful answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I guess I want to ask this one more. And then, please, <laughs> somebody else. Um, as, you, as you related your own personal history and your growth as an artist and pulling in from all of these places and spaces and uh, opportunities, it, it makes me think again of functional ceramics and, and how functional ceramics, people made plates so that people would buy plates and eat off plates. Okay, and that was good. And then we had that huge growth into modern forms. Mm -hmm. Are you are you really thinking that a person would take this broom and sweep their my house with it? Um I, I still have to trim it off. <laughs> okay. Um, and you'll see some trimmed brooms in there. That then it would be slightly more functional. It would be that flat broom that but you're used that, to. Is that your intent? It is my intent. So it is functional. Um, it's a functional craft or art craft. Yes. I do have customers um and and folks who have come back to me saying that it has just remained on their wall. And I talked to them a little bit because um, the, the first broom I made 13 years ago is something that I, I do use uh, on a regular basis. And you can barely tell. The, the material broom corn was chosen because it is so resilient. Um, so it can look like art on the wall when you're not using it and be a functional a routine that you get to experience and enjoy while you're taking care of a rather mundane chore um, all at once. That said, I do like to explore these juxtapositions and there are certain um, more sculptural pieces uh, or perhaps even this one if I chose not to trim it sure. that may be uh, intended less for use. Um, but primarily speaking, I love making sure that some portion of them um, are entirely functional and lasting decades. It will last you a lot longer than any of the vacuums I've purchased recently, which is like a year and a half. And uh, I, you know, these, these can last you 30, 40, 50 years if you treat them well. That's marvelous. Thank you very much. Yeah. So following off on that, um, our designing rooms that are more sculptural objects seemingly look at less have a practicality piece. Like, this would be perfect for sweeping this particular corner of a thing, or like a certain designated function that inspires you, or do you just let like, the form kind of inform the room? Um, I, I do have entirely functional brooms that are very strange shapes, particularly because of that, but um, they, they are still very much meant to be used. Um, and I'm, I've, I've always kind of, um, since veering from kind of more straightforward art into functional art and craft, you know, kind of struggled, I don't know if struggle is the right word, but I'll use it for now, um, of, you know, what if it isn't functional? Um, 
you could still sweep with this. It would actually get lots of nice small particles because I've left on those finer pieces down there. Um, but I also am reminded in, I'm always kind of, and maybe it's frustrating to other people, but I'm always pulling from these different worlds I've been a part of. I'm reminded flower farming has become more and more popular over the last five or 10 years. Um, and a lot of vegetable farmers had mixed feelings about it, but a lot of people are actually uh, more willing to spend more money on luxury items like flowers than really healthy food that these farmers have been trying to grow for a really long time. Um, but thinking through that, I've, I've heard something along the lines of, um, you know, vegetables are food, fruit is food, and flowers are food for the soul. So when I am making a broom that's less uh, intended to be fully functional, I like to think of it as being a broom more for the soul, more an art piece that you can appreciate uh, in its form, like art is food for the soul in general. Does that answer your question? Yes. Are, so I, I love how like interdisciplinary broom making is. There's like woodwork and wood weaving and like natural dye if you want to go down that route. And I'm wondering like, are there new forms or skills or like methodologies that are on your like personal broom making horizon that you're excited to pursue and bring into your own practice? That's a, a wonderful question. Um, I think uh, the, this broom is a good example that the cordage is still um, one of the pieces that is more anonymously sourced. Um, I weave so tightly, there's so much tension in the, the woven part uh, where the bristles connect with the broomstick um, that I haven't found a natural material that can withstand that tension. So that's still nylon which I have mixed feelings about. Um, it's completely functional, but it'll also be floating in an ocean in 5,000 years. Um, so finding um, and working with cordages um, that are strong in te tensile strength um, and exploring natural dyeing more. I had a, a really fun residency um, at Penland School of Craft right before the pandemic, and I was learning from a few studio mates who were amazing natural dyers and I love exploring that. Um, but again, neither of these have I dyed personally. Um, uh, so I, that's like just an area where I feel conflicted that it's, it's okay to, um, have pieces of this process that I don't have my hands in at all times in some ways that's, um, impractical, but it's also part of, my curiosity and part of my practice. So that's that's something I'm exploring. So it is something I want to learn more about, cordage making, natural dyeing. Um, I'm always looking for more local sources of um, wood. Honestly, people are pruning trees all of the time, but connecting with those people when they're pruning is tricky. Um, uh, and I, I mentioned a lot of these different um, crafts that I have learned from craftspeople over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, but all of that has been piecemeal and here and there, and I practice it in my own way. So the the always um, curious part of me feels like I, I could learn so much more in, in, in all of those areas, um, probably particularly um, woodworking in addition to natural dyeing and cordage making. It's a long list. Good question. I bet everyone, yes. So I'm fascinated by this idea between utility and aesthetic. Yeah. Right? So, right, because th this is like right in the center of that for me. Yeah. Um, there's this there's this strain of kind of continental, I'm going to get really deep here, but this continental philosophical thought that like a tool's use and the utility identical, which is just a philosophical way of saying if you identify something as a tool, whatever you use it for, to the extent that it accomplishes that goal, that is its value, right? 
And if you take that kind of its logical conclusion, you end up in this debate about whether or not art can be useful, right? You end up in the whole Oscar Wilde realm of like art cannot be useful. Art art is useless. That's that's a fundamental definition of art. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think there's a there's an in between realm, right? Between utility and uselessness. But that seems to be where we like where we talk about these these sometimes useful objects, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and like I'm curious like when you're thinking about making a broom, how do you think about like how do you work through like utility the utility of the object versus the uselessness of the object? Given that there's this whole strain of like Western art history that associates uselessness with art with value. With value yeah. with the value of art, right? Yes. I mean, I could wax philosophical about brooms all day. <laughs> um <laughs> And I, maybe the short answer is, uh, I'll give you two answers maybe. Like one, I'm pretty comfortable dancing in the gray area, in the soup of it's it's not one or the other, like you say. It, it can be both. And on one day it might be one and on the other it might be another. And um, depending on who you're talking to and, and who has the strongest argument that day, you can easily lean either way. Um, so I, I kind of enjoy that you're kind of dancing on this line. Um, and I, I'm also, I, I kind of find the, the black and white of, of that debate. It's kind of, I don't know, boring isn't the right word, but like, <laughs> let's play in that area where it's unclear. Um, that said, when I'm sitting down and making a broom, whether I'm imagining it in a gallery or intended to be used for 50 years in someone's home, might impact how I'm putting it together. It does. Um, but sometimes it ends up on a d the other wall than I expected. Um, and that's kind of fun. I don't know if that's uh, a settling answer, but that's my answer. Okay, the thing I was about to say is I bet everyone wants to move their bodies now, so. Thank you, everyone. Fruiting from the trees, there's more together. This is what the broom corn looks like. I soak it before I weave it. So this pail is my dear friend. Um, and then there's just a variety of broom shapes, both traditional and inspired by the random pieces of human trash around the homestead um, that I've been working on while I'm here. Uh, like, we have no idea what that is. Oh my gosh, look at this little goofy. Isn't that <laughs> There are two holes on the side. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. Hey, would you mind if you yes. pull that up yeah, and show me? Yeah, that's, picture? I call that a coffee grinder whip. Oh, oh, it's perfect. Nice. Yeah. Oh, it's, so it's, it's so beautiful. It's inspired by a Japanese design, but it works great on all, any small spaces. I know a lot of artists use it in studios. Wow. Um, but kitchens are a good place for it, too. Um, so these were horseshoes until I made them into brooms. Oh, wow. Those two there. Um, there's one odd one that I pointed toward that's still hanging on a tree over by where we were talking. Um, and then back in this corner are some more traditional shapes, cobwebbers, hearth brooms, and full brooms. Um, and you can just kind of get a little peek into the relatively simple uh, tools that I use in broom making over here. That foot stick, which is really just, um, uh, uh, what are those? parts of um, post? Yeah, like a former yeah post um, that I got at Home Resource. That's what I use to hold tension between the cordage that I'm weaving with and my hands, what I'm weaving on. Um, and then most of the tools I use fit in that little blue box that I bring with me everywhere I go. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, these are some of the, the materials I've been using with here at the homestead, wood and um, you know, old pieces of metal. It's a, Sorry. This uh, 
the corn cured some way or wet and dried or is it just um, special ways of you, you, uh, you want to harvest it before the seeds weigh it down because you want it to remain straight. So harvest time is important. And then it can be in storage for quite a while. Um, some folks, I would love to travel the world learning from other fruit making traditions. I know some folks do a scalding um, soak right after harvest. I haven't heard about that as much in the United States. I've seen it in Japan. Um, and that might be to remove pests, um, because I know that's something you have to consider on all plant materials. A lot of folks uh, kiln dry their wood for the same reason or remove uh, the bark. Um, and then before weaving, if weaving is a part of that particular broom, I've been doing it a lot lately because I really love the way it looks and I love the process, um, but some brooms um, don't have that. Uh, I, do, I do need to soak the broom corn. Um, just in water. Just in water, warm water. Um, and and then once it's had a good long soak, uh, it's pliant enough um, to weave with. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions while we're in the tent? What's this little one for? <laughs> um, I, that's just for fun. Its value is to spin above my head while I make rooms. Um, I don't know, there were a few um, pieces of metal that I found that had this round shape, and I haven't, I, I feel like there's, uh, I could do another 12 residencies to explore some of these ideas, but kind of exploring the, um, the lines between for making and basket making and how to like grow off of round pieces of metal that I was finding was something that interested me. Um, so it's just my, my chandelier for now while I think about what it could be. It could be like an analog Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just move it around. Yeah. <laughs> move it around your space. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Is this your team? This is the beautiful space that uh, Katie and Caroline and Moon Randall set me up with for my studio while I'm here. Um, yeah, and it's been a, an absolutely lovely space to work in. Um, one of uh, the many reasons I chose to explore brooms right now that I didn't mention was um, it, it's so um, off-grid. I can you know, make sure I have my basic materials and my foot pedal. There's much more um, industrial and larger ways to do it. There's whole tables, there's mechanized versions. But I love that I can just take my toolbox and my my little uh, foot pedal and take it wherever I can go. Um, so being in the tent was just lovely because it seemed to suit this particular track really well. Should we go check out the garden? Yeah. See some broom corn growing? I've been growing broom corn with and for Grace for a few years. The first year you gave me two types of seed. And if you actually look for broom corn seed in the United States and you go to like a seed catalog like Johnny's or if you go online to look at seeds from even like an organic seed company, you're going to find ornamental broom corn. And that's broom corns for looks, not brooms. <laughs> that's what all those, those flower farmers are using these days. Yeah, and it's, it's super color. beautiful. Yeah. But the bristles are like not really long enough for like a proper kitchen broom. And so Grace was telling me about this, but then you, so you gave me some ornamental broom corn and then you gave me some broom corn seed that was from a broom maker who also selects and breeds broom corn plants? Is that right? Yes. What's his story? Well, so I, I was coming up here this evening trying to remember if I gave you seed from Sam Moyer, who's like a 97-year-old uh, plant geneticist, Whoa. from Squire, um, or there's a, another fellow in the Midwest who's also been, been growing some, named Johnny. Johnny something. Um, 
but I think because it, it is a dwarf variety that has been most successful for us, I'm pretty sure it was actually that Midwest guy, not the Sam guy in the Northeast. But I, I want to look at my records to make sure, because I think having that, um, that seed line back to the originator would be really helpful to, to make oh, sure yeah. that goes yellow. <laughs> yeah, both of them have done pretty well, but the one that this last couple of years has been a lot of room, the ornamental room corn, the plant will get to like eight or ten feet, but then the bristle ends up like this long. And that's not going to do us any good. Um, so this dwarf variety that's worked really well only puts the energy into being about this tall for the stalk, and then the rest of the energy goes into to long bristles. Um, so yeah, I need to do my research. I also think that like the dwarf stature does a lot better in our super short growing season here in Montana. So I noticed two things about the two varieties. I was like, the dwarf, the dwarf variety is definitely like coming to full maturity a lot sooner and in time for our like first frost in the fall. And then I felt like, like we observed that the, the bristles were a lot, a lot longer. And so since then I've only grown the dwarf, but this year I'm dedicating two beds to broom corn. So, and then I, they're actually split down the middle with this lane of uh, lower salmon river winter squash that I got from Triple Divide Seed Cooperative, which is going to sort of like vine out and is vining out like all the way over here and like up that fence and going kind of crazy. So this was planned to be this way. Um, and we're growing 85 individual plants, which is a really nice population size to save seed from, where we're not creating any kind of genetic bottleneck for this particular variety. So this year, since Grace is here and is our artist, we are gonna do a little bit of selection. So that what that means is if we see any traits that we don't necessarily like, we'll prevent them from pollinating or crossing with some of the other individuals that we have. And then my guess is that we'll select some to like save for making brooms and then the very very best plants with the longest bristles will allow them to fully mature their seeds and then we'll save those seeds and we'll probably have an abundance of them and we'll be able to share them with other folks who are growing brooms for grace and that way we're selecting for long bristles on these plants in this soil in this climate in our short growing season that's super exciting and I'm really stoked for it. <laughs> um, I also want to point out that this plant is very drought resistant anyway. It has a C4 photosynthetic pathway and the leaves also kind of curl up in the middle of the day to prevent a ton of like transpirational water loss. And so that's why you see the leaves curling up like that. But at night they'll totally open up and recommence to photosynthesizing. So. They're super drought hardy, and I only water this garden once a week, which is not very much for gardens in Western Montana. So once plants are established, I start to train them off of water um, under a strategy called like planned, uh, planned like, uh, it's like called, it's called reduced irrigation management. So that's what we're doing on these selecting for long bristles, which is just like very nerdy for my farmer brain. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, traditionally broom, broom corn, like I mentioned, was a pretty big ag agricultural product when there were broom factories in most major cities and lots of towns had their own broom makers. Um, and it grew quite well all the way from Colorado to Illinois where there, there were, you know, big, uh, big swaths of land being used to grow broom corn. Um, and I do feel like our season is a little short. So this seems to be working pretty well, all things considered. Yeah. Do y'all have any questions? Also, it's not going to cross with the actual corn, which is over here. <laughs> it's so confusing, but they're not, yeah, they are not going to cross pollinate. They're cousins. Cousins. How Grasses? did they get its name? Why is it called blue corn if it's a florium? I think it just looks like corn. Okay. It, I mean, they look really similar. They look very similar. Yeah. Grace, I always got a kick out of your communication with the 97-year-old. Sam Boyer? Yeah. Can you tell us about how that's gone? Yeah. <laughs> sure. I need to reach out to him again, but he, he's a fella, I think, like, in New Jersey or something, who had a history as a plant geneticist and a scientist, uh, but also learned the art of broom making um, in the United States that's considered a broom squire. I'm still looking for another 
title. <laughs> so he, he, he always signs his, uh, his communication, Sam Moyer, PhD, Broom Squire. Um, and he's the one who I first got seeds from. And I don't even remember how I found him originally. I think I read an article about him 10 years ago. Yes, there's dirt on my foot. That's the way I like it. This is June and this is John. And they've made this residency possible. <laughs> um, as well as Connie. Where's Connie? Yeah. Hey, Connie. Um, she's been hanging with June a lot to let me make rooms. Because that's a lot of tension to hold around a baby. Um, anyway, so, and it, uh, there are a couple of, there, there's a small broom making community, um, which is really fun. And it is one of those, I don't know, random listservs or little newspaper clippings that I got Sam Moyer's contact information, and he loves making sure seeds are getting out there, which is why I'm curious if it's the Sam or the John guy that I got the ones that are really working well from. Um, yeah, and it, it's a really supportive community um, about of equally nerdy people who love brims. Grace, there's something interesting. It's really neat to be standing here where the, uh, sorry, broom, broom, broom corn. Broom corn, thank you. I'm like, it's not a weed, it's beyond weed. Um, broom corn is growing, like something about, you started the, You started your talk talking about time and like long time, and there's something, you know, I feel like the mind can consume something conceptually, but not embody that experience. And so there's something really interesting about having like, just visited the makings and to come here and stand amidst it and to at least even get a little sense closer to the relationship with time in your craft. And it seems like such a key piece about it, like, oh, to actually slow down long enough to consider the making of the object that's then used to sweep, especially in our contemporary world. It's just like, it's, it's really lovely to have the, the physicality of that experience. So, yeah. I, I feel really lucky to have been placed here. There's a lot of um, fun ways uh, that that things have connected through this residency um, but yeah to your point one of the nice things for people who are interested in time and growth and being able to see how that directly uh, like uh, every, every art form has materials that come from something somewhere but this really makes it very apparent especially when we can actually see the broom corn growing and then see last year's broom corn on that big tall broom I showed you um, but to, to also let that reflect into like where where are the other materials I'm using coming from yeah. it's something I always like to do yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. yeah Kelly um, I'm also struck by when you talked about the flowers versus growing food yeah that your broom corn is almost like a third category of plant where it's almost like a working plant. Growing function. Yeah, like yeah. it's got a job to do outside of the garden, um, which is really cool that this garden is growing all of these different yeah. types of plants. Plants are so wonderful. Do you have any dye plants in here? Because then we could get into natural dyeing as well. <laughs> um, yeah, we do. I know people use marigold yeah. for dye. I don't know if amaranth is a traditional natural dye plant. Possibly. But I don't do any natural dye myself. So we do this is like a medicinal herb garden and there's a lot going on, but not the natural dye. Maybe next year. But there it is fun to think I, we we put like plants in the categories about the way that they function in our lives currently. Um, but we can we can kind of realize that there's a lot more beyond how they currently work in our lives and how they've worked historically throughout the world. Um, or have entirely different functions and values. Yeah. Any other questions? I guess you haven't talked about where you're going from here. <laughs> I mean, this is an amazing experience, and add it to your resume. And uh, I always, where, where folks are from and where they go after the residencies here. Are you? You have a base somewhere? Or? Yeah. Um, I'm based here in Missoula, which is uh, quite convenient this particular time in my life where I've got a little one and a half year old <laughs> um, but I don't know if I have a, a, a answer to your question that's um, that's sufficient for for this type of setting um, I'm gonna keep making things and keep finding people in places that 
um, have the same level of curiosity and uh, the same um, interest in exploring where brooms and broom adjacent sculptures will go <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and go from there. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Grace. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You.